When the Emperor Theodosius died in early 395, he left the Roman Empire to his two sons. The older son, Arcadius, was to rule from the east and was already 18 when he took the throne. The younger son was to rule from the west. He was a boy, not yet 11 years old. Spoiler, this is where the history of Western and Eastern Rome diverge. As you may know, the Eastern Roman Empire has another millennium of history ahead. The Western Roman Empire, on the other hand, has hardly 80 years. The remainder of my series on the Emperors of Rome will be covering just those 80 years, though I will certainly visit Eastern Roman history in the future. Before we plunge into the final phase of Western Roman imperial history, we have to take a proper survey of what has changed for Rome in the last couple centuries. In order to appreciate the storms that are about to sweep over the Roman world, one must realize that this is not the Rome of Augustus. It is not the Rome of Marcus Aurelius. It is not the Rome of Diocletian, nor is it even the Rome of Constantine. This Rome is something entirely different. The defining characteristic of late Rome was economic decline. Ever since the beginning of the crisis of the 3rd century, Rome had been on a steady economic downturn. The volume of trade, both internal and external, was declining. Currency was debased, inflated, and practically worthless in many places. Material conditions were slowly deteriorating mostly for the lower classes and particularly on the vulnerable frontier regions, which were frequently subjected to destructive raids. This economic decline had obvious effects on the strength of the Roman government. Taxes were harder to come by, meaning that training, supplying, equipping, and sustaining a standing army of hundreds of thousands of men became more and more impossible. While Rome's capacity to respond to threats was declining, those threats became more and more menacing. For centuries, the tribes on the Roman frontiers had been increasing in size, cohesion, and ambition. Confederations like the Franks and Alamanni were persistent dangers to the Roman border, and other peoples like the Goths and Vandals were pushing on the boundaries of the frontier day by day. Historians speculate that many of these Germanic tribes came from thousands of miles away, whether from Scandinavia or the Black Sea and beyond. Migratory pressures like climatic shifts and attacks from other tribes pushed these Germanic tribes west until they were running up against the Roman frontiers. The chief culprit responsible for these migratory pressures were the famous and terrible Huns. For these migrating tribes, the Huns represented death and destruction while Rome represented a rich promised land where they could make safe new homes. For centuries, Rome had been able to resist these pressures from external forces. Those days of Roman strength were long gone, replaced by eminent and obvious weaknesses in every corner of the Roman defense network. The day when the frontiers finally fall is not far. This was the Rome of 395, at least in the West. The East is a different story, and it is a story for another day. The West Rome of 395 was in terminal decline. Meanwhile, storms that had been brewing just beyond the horizon of the frontiers were finally ready to rage with all their terrible force. And positioned to face down these once in a millennium storms was a 10 year old boy named Honorius. Just to preface this a bit more, the three-decade reign of Honorius is defined more by what he did not do than by what he did do. Rome is now entering an era where foreign generals act as the real leaders of the Roman military and government, making the emperors into figureheads. Honorius' general was a man named Stilicho, who was of half-Vandal descent. When Honorius was a boy, Stilicho was in control of the court. In 395, shortly after the death of Theodosius, a group of Roman allied Goths began raiding the Roman countryside in the Balkans. 
This group of Goths was led by Alaric and was the same group that had fought for Theodosius the year earlier at the Battle of the Frigidus. They were pissed off that the Romans had mistreated them on the battlefield, and they broke the terms of their treaty with Rome by attacking towns and civilians. Stilicho could not accept this and marched out from Italy with the army from the Frigidus to face Alaric. In this first campaign, Alaric was outmaneuvered in the hills and was surrounded by Stilicho's larger army. In order to avoid being crushed and destroyed, Alaric negotiated and stalled for time, which proved crucial. In pursuing Alaric, Stilicho had entered the territory of Arcadius in the Eastern Empire, and the court officials of the East were not happy. They ordered Stilicho to leave immediately, which he reluctantly did. Alaric and his Goths were thus left alone. This would prove to be a horrible mistake. After this unsatisfactory conclusion with Alaric, Stilicho took his army west and led them against the Franks on the Rhine in 396, winning some modest victories. He also secured agreements with the Franks and Alamanni, recruiting them for the defense of the Rhine River. The next year he tried his luck with Alaric again, but was again unable to capture the rogue king before further complaints and threats from the eastern court. The eastern court was actually frightened that Stilicho was trying to take their territory, when in reality he was simply trying to defend the empire. It seemed that Stilicho was the only one who really realized how dangerous Alaric was. In 398, Stilicho crossed the channel and fought off an invasion from the Picts. This was the last time that an Imperial Roman army set foot on British soil. Three years later, in 401, Stilicho was responding to an invasion of Roman territory beyond the Alps. Alaric, who had reassembled a sizable army, saw an opportunity and bypassed Stilicho's army, slipping into Italy through the Alps and besieging Milan, where Honorius was residing with his court. As soon as he received word, Stilicho ended his campaign and marched down to Milan as fast as possible, relieving the siege. He then attacked the Goths on Easter of 402 at the Battle of Pollentia, winning a decisive victory. Again, he failed to capture Alaric, but it was not for lack of trying. After negotiations, however, Stilicho appears to have changed his mind about Alaric, instead trying to recruit him again as a defender of the Empire and sending him with official blessings to occupy Illyria. After the close call in Milan, Stilicho also advised Honorius to move his court to Ravenna, which was pretty much impossible to capture by siege due to its position within a ring of swamps. Honorius took this advice, hiding himself away from the rest of his empire. In 405, Stilicho was faced with another massive invasion, this one from a Gothic king named Radagaisus who crossed the Danube with a large confederation army. Reportedly, Stilicho had to resort to desperate measures to assemble even an army of 20,000 soldiers for this campaign, enrolling thousands of slaves with little to no military training. This was how bad things had gotten for Rome. Through a series of clever tricks, Stilicho managed to outmaneuver and destroy the army of Radagaisus in 406. He executed Radagaisus himself, and captured many of the Goths, forcing them into Roman service. Stilicho was riding high at the end of 406. One can imagine him having a lively Christmas celebration with Honorius, who was just celebrating his 22nd birthday. But maybe they should have waited a little bit longer. The same night Stilicho was getting drunk and celebrating the new year, a massive confederation of German tribes was crossing the frozen Rhine River into Roman Gaul. This was an unprecedented breach of the Roman frontier, and it stunningly took place with no resistance whatsoever. On New Year's Day of 407, there were tens of thousands of Germans in Gaul, mostly Vandals, Alans, Burgundians, and Suebi, aiming to raid and pillage the rich Roman province. 
It's unclear why there was so little resistance to this crossing. Some speculate that the Franks, who had been contracted to protect the Rhine, just decided it was in their better interests to not oppose the raiders. At the same time that these Germanic tribes were rampaging through Gaul, a revolt was burning in Britain. Fears of instability and imperial collapse led the British legions to declare one of their soldiers, Constantine, as emperor, making him Constantine III. In early 407, Constantine took the remaining British legions across the channel into Gaul, marking the final withdrawal of Roman military authority from the island. After 407, Britain was lost. Constantine established himself in Gaul, securing the Rhine frontier again, but failing to eliminate the raiding hordes still rampaging through the Roman countryside. These hordes, primarily of Vandal origin, would be in Hispania by the end of 408. His more immediate concern was Honorius, who sent Stilicho on a campaign to attack Constantine. Throughout 407 and 408, these campaigns were inconclusive, only serving to distract Roman power from the real problems. Speaking of real problems, Alaric was back for more. In 407, he invaded Italy once again and demanded a large ransom in gold in return for withdrawing from the province. Stilicho, overwhelmed by military threats from all sides, paid the ransom. His thinking was that the ransom was a small price to pay compared to what a hostile Alaric would forcibly seize from Rome. However, this ransom appeared to be an affront to Roman honor, and Stilicho was making enemies with his lenient treatment of Alaric. Things came to a head in August of 408, when his army in northern Italy mutinied. This was likely staged by Honorius and his court officials. Shortly after, Stilicho was taken into custody and executed. It's unclear why exactly Stilicho was executed. Some speculate that he was trying to stage a coup against Honorius, but the evidence for this is really thin. In any case, the death of Stilicho was also the death of able leadership for Rome. Honorius and his officials decided it was a good move to declare Alaric an enemy of Rome, which basically amounted to a declaration of war. Italy, and all of Rome, would pay for this. One of his senior court officials also thought it was wise to slaughter the families of Italy's Federate soldiers. These foreign soldiers, after realizing the extent of Roman treachery, all left in the thousands and joined Alaric's army. Alaric invaded Italy once again in late 408. Many of his soldiers were thirsting for blood and revenge. The next two years would see nothing but indecision and vacillation from Honorius. While he was protected from any danger himself behind the walls and swamps of Ravenna, the rest of Italy was at Alaric's mercy. The details and developments are convoluted, but just know that Honorius flipped several times from open hostility to amiable negotiation. Eventually, Alaric's patience for Honorius ran out. Honorius had no armies to oppose him when he marched on Rome in August of 410, laying a brief siege before breaching the city walls and sacking the city. This was the first time that foreigners had sacked the Eternal City for nearly a thousand years. Perhaps we should address a common story about Honorius. He apparently owned a chicken that was named Rome. When someone came to tell him that Rome had fallen, he reportedly said, but she has just eaten from my hands. Probably didn't happen, but it's still funny. Alaric died shortly after the sack of Rome, but things were no less of a mess. His Goths were still marauding through Roman territory. The usurper Constantine was still in Gaul. The Vandals were still in Hispania, and Honorius could do little about it. He did find a new favorite general, a man named Constantius, and he sent him with an army against Constantine in 411. 
Well, technically, he was also fighting one of Constantine's generals, who had also revolted against Constantine and was currently besieging Constantine at Arles. After defeating that general, he continued the siege of Arles and was victorious, succeeding in capturing and executing the usurper. Over the next decade, he would prosecute fairly successful campaigns against the foreign armies in Gaul and Hispania. By this point, no Roman army in the West was strong enough to really destroy any of these foreign armies, but Constantius successfully contained the Goths in Hispania. He eventually convinced the Goths to settle for a treaty in 418. Under the terms, they would be given independent authority over the region of Aquitaine in Gaul. They would also fight against the Vandals and other enemies of Rome. There was now an independent Gothic state within Roman territory. Honestly, even if Constantine could have destroyed the Goths, he definitely wouldn't have wanted to. Rome was in such desperate need of soldiers, and although allowing the Goths so much autonomy wasn't the best idea, killing off Rome's potential manpower would have been an even worse idea. In 421, Honorius decided that Constantius was cool enough to be emperor, and so he made him his co-ruler in the west. Before the eastern court could even recognize this choice though, he had already died of unknown causes. So Honorius was again alone at the top. Only for a couple more years though. He died in 423, at the age of 38, having ruled the western Roman Empire for 28 years. The story of the reign of Honorius has suspiciously little to do with Honorius himself. There are a lot of stories about him, but not a lot of things that he really did. Honestly, he was sort of like wallpaper to this whole period of time. During his reign, Gaul and Hispania were irreparably ravaged by barbarian invasions, and Roman imperial authority utterly collapsed in most regions of the West. Although some semblance of stability was restored by the end of his reign, he could take no responsibility for any of it. On the other hand, all the mistakes that led to the sack of Rome can be placed squarely on his shoulders. His uncontrollable vacillation and inability to act decisively served to paralyze the imperial government in one of Rome's most desperate times. Honorius is gone, but these desperate times are not. The first waves of the storm have passed, and Rome is still surviving. But future storms will make this episode seem like a pleasant rain shower. The worst is yet to come. <laughs> <laughs>